All right, now this is um, <clears throat> not a very pleasant story that we read here in 2 Samuel chapter 13, but it's a very powerful story, and there's something that we're going to learn from it this morning. And what I'm going to be teaching about this morning is how strong of an influence that friends can have in our life. Now, we just read this entire chapter, and we're going to get back to this in a minute, but you notice there in... Um, Verse number three, it says, but Amnon had a friend. So this is Amnon's friend that, that got him involved in, in, in doing such wickedness and everything like that. And we're, we're going to get into that a little bit more in just a minute. But the friends that we choose to have, the friends that we decide to be friends with, will have an influence in our life. It could be a very strong influence. So we need to be very careful who we choose to be our friends, because we all have choices to make. We, you could choose. You're not forced to be friends with anyone. You know, you can't choose your parents. You can't choose your siblings. You know, you're born into that. But you can choose your friends. And the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 24, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. So basically, it's the first part of the verse is saying, you know, when you have friends. You need to show yourself friendly, meaning showing yourself to be a friend. Having friends, you shouldn't have friends that you're always relying on them for things and, and what can they do for me. Having friends are friends where you help them out. Being friendly towards them. Being a friend to somebody is, is doing things for them. And that's, that's how we ought to be. That's how we ought to treat our friends. Anyone you're friends with, you should be thinking, well, how are they going to do me good? No, it's the opposite. You need to be thinking, hey, how can I help this person? Out? How can I be a friend to this person? And in order to have friends, you need, you need to be that way too. I mean, no one, if you're just going out and using people, no one's going to want to be your friend anyways. But the second part of that verse says, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. So having a friend can be very, I mean, it's a very strong, not only a strong influence, but it's a very good thing to have. We ought, we ought to be able to make close friendships with people because when you can, you can find someone to be a friend with, they can be very close to you and stick by you and really be able to help you even more than like a physical brother that you have or a physical sister that you have in the flesh. Someone who's a friend that's closer by you, near you all the time and able to help you out. Our friends are very important. They're very important to have. We, we, ought, to, we ought to all try to have friends. Now, it doesn't, you don't have to have 100 friends or whatever, but just having one or two really good friends is going to do you very well, not only to be able to help them out, but for them helping you out as well. This should be able to work both ways there and to find a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Now, your friends will also be able to give you advice. And, and we all know this. This isn't, this isn't anything that's like, you know, earth shattering or groundbreaking. I've never heard this before. It's common sense. When you have friends, they give you advice or they give you counsel on things. Why? Because you find someone and you open up to them and you'll talk to them about your problems, things going on in your life, whatever's going on, and they're there to help you. They're, they're there for you to be able to confide in them, to be able to talk about things that you wouldn't necessarily talk to with, with most other people. And you expect them to be able to help you and to give you a little bit of guidance or to give you some comfort or to be able to lift you up in your, in your times of trouble. Like, you know, Job had terrible friends. You see, Job, Job even said, you know, you're all, um, what was the word he used? He said, you're miserable comforters. <laughs> because what did they do? When Job was going through the worst time in his life and probably the worst time in anybody's life, I mean, that, that was so bad, everything that he had to deal with, with the loss of his, the loss of his wealth, the loss of his family, the, you know, the loss of his health, all these things were going wrong. And what is, his friends came to comfort him and all they kept doing was telling him that he's in sin. Oh, well, you brought this on yourself, Job. Come on, just tell us. What did you do? You know, you, 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 you screwed up. You did something and he didn't. And he didn't do it. It's not like they knew that he was in sin and were rebuking him for it. They didn't. They were just saying, well, you must be in sin. And they were totally wrong. So not only did he lose everything, but then he's got his friends coming over and saying, well, you must have done something wrong. You know, well, yeah, that's, that's real comforting. Thanks a lot, pal. You know, <laughs> and that's why, you know, especially we, we've had this attitude in church and, it's, you know, among, among other people in church, when things are going wrong in their life, we don't just assume that, oh, they must have gotten, they must have gotten some, into some sin or something. We don't deal with people that way. 
We comfort them. We try to help them. Oh man, I'm sorry. What can I do for you? You know, don't just start thinking, oh, I wonder what they did. They're in this or they're in that. Now, if you're aware that somebody got involved in some kind of sin and God ends up chastening for them, that's a different story. I mean, that's a lot easier to tell. But like with Job, they had, they had no evidence. They had nothing to say that, oh, he was in this sin because he wasn't. It would be one thing if they knew like, oh yeah, Job cheated on his wife and all these bad things started to happen. You say, well, you know what? God's chastening you. He's disciplining you. And that, and that would be a righteous judgment. But um, I don't want to get off into that. I, I preach a sermon about righteous judgment, things like that. This morning, I'm trying to focus on, on a friend. And in Proverbs 27, verse number 9, the Bible says, Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart, so doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel, by giving good counsel, by being able to help and to um, give, give your friend good advice. The Bible says, Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not. Neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity, for better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off. And again, going along with that point of a, a friend sticking closer than a brother. I have brothers, two brothers that are, that are scattered across the United States. You know, when I, when I have hard times, I know I could rely on them. I know that they'll help me out no matter what I would need. I mean, they're my brothers, Right? And that's the same way with them. I would, I would help them out because they're my brothers, you know, they're family. Of course I'd help them out, but I've got one in Missouri and another one in South Carolina. That's not going to, you know, it, it's a lot better for me to have friends here, good friends, a friend that's going to stick even closer than a brother. So in the day of calamity, like the Bible says, you know, it's, it's better to have a neighbor that is near than a brother that's far off. So I could have someone right here to be able to immediately uh, help out with things and, um, and for me to be able to help them out too, right? I mean, that's, that's what the Bible's teaching. So we have friends, we choose friends because one, they're going to be able to help us and give us advice. And we need to be able to recognize how important and powerful that is because what we see here, now we're going to go back to 2 Samuel 13, we're going to dig in this chapter a little bit more, is an example of Amnon who chose a really, really bad friend. He, he, he made a very poor choice in, in who he decided to be friends with because Jonadab was a wicked man. And sometimes people may be teetering and not quite knowing, hey, which, you know, what's the right decision I should do? And they're being tempted with sin. And all they need, would need is the good friend to say, hey, you know, don't, don't even be thinking about that. Get as far away as possible. You know, that's not what you need. That's not going to help you to be able to, to, to give you that sound judgment and just this a biblical wisdom and say, you know, you should have nothing to do with that. But a bad friend, like we see here in Jonadab, he, he eggs him on. He actually gives him a plan to fulfill the lusts of his flesh. And Right off the bat, because you could see, you could kind of tell by the way the story is worded, Amnon wouldn't have done these things all on his own. Let's reread here in verse number one. The Bible says, And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. So David had many children. Just to get this straight, David had children by different women. David had multiple wives. Okay? So Absalom... And his sister Tamar were born of, a, of one particular woman. Amnon was born from a different woman. So Tamar is his sister, but it's not his sister by his father and mother. It's only his sister by his father. You know, it's like a half-sister. Not, not saying that that's still not wicked, okay? But it's not quite exactly the same as, as, as full-blood uh, sister. But um, in any case, we have here... In verse 2, it says, And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. So he, he gets infatuated with his sister. Okay, he says he fell sick for her. He really loved her. And, but, then he, but he thought it hard. Like He's like, I can't do anything because she's my sister. right? I can't, I can't do anything. He knew what, that it, was, it would be wrong to do anything like that or to, to have a relationship with her. So he's like, I know that this isn't right and I shouldn't do this. He already knew that. 
But he's struggling with this, right? He, he knows right from wrong, but he's struggling with it still because of his feelings, because of his flesh, because of his emotions. He's having a hard time with this. So he, what does he do? He confides in his friend because his friend notices. Verse number three, but Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. And when you're choosing friends, being very subtle, that's not a good quality to find in a friend. The Bible talks about the serpent, that the serpent was very subtle. That was more subtle than all the beasts of the field. Subtlety here is, is uh, you know, he's, he's tricky. He's, he's, uh, he's, deceive, he's a deceiver. And um, let's keep reading verse number four. It says, and he said unto him, why art thou being the king's son lean from day to day? So he notices him. He's visibly, you know, just not doing very well. You can tell he's real bothered. He's got a lot of things on his mind. And he's saying, hey, you're the king's son. You know, you, what? Why should you have any problem? You should have no, I mean, the king's son, you should have everything open to you. You should be able to get whatever you want. So what in the world could possibly be bothering you? Why are you lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. So he comes out and says, well, here's what's bothering me. Here's what, why I'm, I'm so distressed and I'm so vexed. It's because I love, I love Absalom's sister. I love my sister Tamar. And you know, he says Absalom's sister. He doesn't say his sister, but... Um, Verse number five, and Jonadab said unto him, lay thee down on a bed. So this is Jonadab's plan. He's saying, okay, well, I'm going to help you out now. Here's what you need to do. Lay down on your bed. He said, make thyself sick. Pretend to be sick. Just, just pretend like, oh, I need help. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come and give me meat and dress the meat in my sight that I may see it and eat it at her hand. He said, here's what you do. Here's how you get Tamar into your bedroom with you. You pretend to be sick, and then you ask your father to send her over to, get, to bring you some food and to feed it to you. This is a really bad friend. He knows what a struggle he's having with this, and instead of saying, no, you shouldn't do anything, as you already know, that would be wickedness, he, he brings it even further to him and says, oh yeah, here's, here's how you do it. And he gives him this plan. And he's already struggling. He's already kind of weak. So you know what he does? He says, oh, yeah, you know what? That's a pretty good hand, a, a good plan. And he goes forward with this. And just like any sin, you know, Amnon still might not have been thinking he was necessarily going to do anything right away. But as, as you allow more things to go and you kind of step more and more, progress into this, it gets to the point to where he's, he's going to do what he's going to do. And there's no turning back. And even his sister tries stopping him and telling him, wait, you know, like, like don't do this. Don't do so wickedly. And, and he forced her. That's what he says. He says don't force me. You know, don't, don't. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a wicked sin in and of itself. That, and that is a sin that's worthy of death in the Bible, of forcing somebody like that. And it was his own sister. But she, she's trying to plead with him in verse 12, she says, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. She said, you're being very foolish. Don't be a fool. Don't do this. And she, you know, she's pleading with them. She's like, where am I going to go? I'm going to be shamed. You know, don't bring this reproach upon me. And she said, um, you know, how be it he would not hearken unto her voice, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. And then he ends up hating her. And of course, you know, we, we know that obviously that this is the wrong choice. A good friend would be able to warn you and say, you know, and get your head clear. He knew it was wrong, but he let his flesh take over and he gave an occasion to the flesh to just get involved in sin and get involved in a really wicked sin. A good friend is going to tell you, hey, don't, don't get involved with that. But a bad friend is going gonna, is gonna to make it easier for you to destroy your life. And what I want to point out also in this chapter is that not only did he, did he force his sister, which already was worthy of death, then he ended up hating her because that's usually what happens anyways when people, it's, it's, it's kind of weird how it happens, but someone that's, you know, he loved her and loved her and he's infatuated with her and he just wants, to, he just loves her so much. But because he forced her, because he commit such a violent act upon her, in, in himself, he, he, I would say probably he hates himself for doing it, but he, he projects that back onto her and hates her. 
and, and despises the, the object of what he loved. And one of the reasons why, because he ended up using her as an object and not, not actually loving her the way that, that he thought he loved her before. And you see that actually happens quite a bit. And when people get forced, especially within families and people get molested and things like that, in, in, in this type of situation, when someone loves them, then they end up hating them. And, and he says, it says here that the hatred that he had for her was even more than the love that he had for her. That he hated her even more than he had loved her previously. And uh, it's just so, it's so damaging. It's such, a, it's such a, a terrible thing to have happened. And it all hinged on him having this friend. It all hinged on him having this friend that just led him down the wrong path. And ultimately, we see that it costs him his life. Because Absalom... The brother of Tamar, he knows what happened, and he's angry. And he's just waiting and biding his time for two years. He waits, and he, and he doesn't fully let on how much he hates him. He, say he hates him, but he, say, he didn't say good or bad to him. And then he finally devises a plan. He, says to, he talks to David. He's like, hey, you know, let's all have this big feast. Let me bring everyone over. And then he's like, okay, first he invites a king. And the king's like, no, no, I can't go. I'm not going you know, to go. And then he has, well, how about Amnon and the rest of my brothers and sisters? Let, let's let them all come over. He's like, well, why do you want Amnon to come over? Because David knew what happened also. And David was mad about it. But see, this is another area where I believe David failed because he didn't allow the proper judgment to happen because it was his own, his, in his family. And he knew what the right judgment was, but he didn't go forward with it. And, and, it should, and that's why when Amnon ends up dying, it actually is a relief to David because he knows that's the right judgment. But see, it's not right then for Absalom not to take things in his own hand. David was the king. He's the judge. He's the one that's supposed to be able to, if, if the hardest of matters, be able to say, this is right. You, you forced her. You deserve to die. And be able to put her to death lawfully and legally in the way that it should have been done. But he didn't do that. So Absalom had to take things in his own hands to try to seek out justice. And he does that. And Amnon ends up dying. And, uh, and Absalom has to run away and, and flee for a while because he, uh, because he did that. Now, the impact one person had, Jonadab, caused events to happen that completely destroyed Amnon's life and literally to the point where he, was, he died as a result of it, as a result of his actions, as a result of the, the counsel that he received from his bad friend, he ends up dying. And to show a little bit more of the subtlety of Jonadab, it's kind of interesting. Not only did he give this advice to Amnon, we see later on, he knew what was going on. He somehow, he knew that Amnon was going to be put to death when it happened because he tells David when things are just kind of happening and, and, it, and there's still, no one really knows exactly what's going on. He tells David, oh no, don't think that all of your children are dead. It's, it's only Amnon. Let's look at that in verse number 30. It says, and it came to pass while they're in the way, that tidings came to David. So David just gets this news. This is brand new news. And Jonadab's with him saying, Absalom hath slain all the king's sons and there's not one of them left. So he gets the news saying, man, Absalom went crazy and all the, ki all the king's children are dead. Which wasn't true. It was, it was bad information. But you know, when big events happen, sometimes you see this in the news, oftentimes false reports come out, people don't have all the information together, and someone says something, or they think they hear someone say something, they run with it, and they go with that. So they bring the bad information saying all the king's sons are dead. That wasn't true. It says here, then the king arose and tear his garments and lay on the earth, and all his servants stood by, with, stood by with their clothes rent. And Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother, answered and said, let not my lord suppose that they have slain all the young men, the king's sons, for Amnon only is dead, for by the appointment of Absalom, this has been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. So he already knew. He's like, no, no, no. It's just, it's just Amnon. Don't believe them. How would he know that? Because he's a subtle man. And it also makes you... 
consider a thing. The Bible doesn't say this, but, but you start wondering, was that his plan all along? Was he setting up Amnon, his friend? We don't know, but we do know this. And this, and this is what I really want to, want to drive home is who our friends are and really pay attention to who you're hanging around with because the, the results of who you choose to be friends with can be devastating. And they could just lead you down the wrong path and end up destroying your life. It's an important decision to make and we need to make sure we have the right friends. Who you surround yourself with is who you will most be like. The more, the more time you spend around with, your, you know, with different friends, you end up picking up attributes that they have. You end up being more like them. You'll end up talking more like them. If anyone here, you probably have noticed this before, we have friends, maybe you have a friend that that's, you weren't real close to before and they use a certain um, like phrases or certain speech, right? They, they, they might say something all the time that you've never said, but you start hanging around with them more, what happens? You start saying the same things. Right? I'll give, I got a couple examples of me personally. So when I moved out to Arizona from Chicago, you know, I spake different when I lived in Chicago than out here. Okay, now some of, some of the accent is, is gone after being here for so long. I don't, I don't uh, talk about my car anymore like that. I don't, you know, there's certain things that I, that I don't really say the same way. But um, one of the things I've met when I met people out here is a lot of people were saying, yeah, right on, right on, yeah, right on. I never said that. I'd never even heard that before from anyone. But guess what happened? After hanging out with new people and I hear that all the time, guess what I started saying? Right on, right on. Why? Because you're influenced. You hear other people. Now, is that a sin or is that wicked or wrong? No, it's not. But the point is just to show you how people can influence you and that you could pick up things like that without even realizing it. Even a more funny example, I was working at a, in a hospital cafeteria once and I was washing pots and you know, washing the dishes and stuff like that. And there were a lot, I worked mostly with black people. Okay. And this was again in Chicago and Eh, I'm not going to be too careful with my words. It's not, it's not a big deal. The, the, the language that they used was, let's say, Ebonics. Okay? So the language that they used culturally is very different than what I was used to, but these are the people I was surrounded by on a regular basis, working a full-time job. Guess what? I started to, to pick up on that a little bit. And I would go after work and, and, and hang out with my friends and I'd say something. I'd catch them. I was like, what in the world am I saying? It's just... You're in that environment for so long, it rubs off on you. And when you have friends, it's going gonna, it's gonna to influence you. It's going to impact you. So this is what I'm saying is that, you know, that's not always going to be sinful, but we need to be aware that um, who you choose to be around is going to influence who you are and how you're going to act and, and things like that. You know, we take after the people that we spend time with. Turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 34. Genesis chapter 34. Because there is a thing called, you know, we've all heard this before, peer pressure. It's a real, it's real. It exists. Being around friends that, that can influence you and pressure you into doing something that maybe you wouldn't normally have done, but because you've decided to be in this group or you want to be in a particular group of friends, you want to have certain people to be your friends and be friends with, you want to be accepted by them and you're going to end up doing things that you wouldn't normally do just to, to, to be around them or to be with them. And that is, that is always a wrong choice to make of just doing things just to be accepted by people because we ought to live our life where we are focused on being accepted by God. And we, don't, we shouldn't have to worry about what other people are going to think. Now, especially with children, I understand this. Children and adults likewise, but children especially, you know, it may be harder to deal with a concept of maybe being alone a little bit or not having very many friends. And 
naturally you're going to want to make friends. And if it's hard to find a good friend, you might compromise your beliefs and just in order to have a friend and to have somebody close to you because it feels good to have a friend. It's nice to have somebody close to you. But even though it's, it's a nice feeling to have a friend, we want to make sure that, that we're not just choosing someone who's a wicked person, someone like a Jonadab, because in the end it's going to do way more harm to you than good. So we want to we want to be very careful in choosing our friends and kids. You know, you need to be really respecting your parents and listening to them on this, because they know a lot more than you do, and and you have to rely on their judgment. And parents, you know, be paying attention to who your children spend time with, and and who their friends are, because you know the Bible said we we went over this last week that um, that if any man love the world, that the love of the Father is not in him. So, like, I don't want, for example, I don't want my children to become friends with just anybody and just to be becoming friends with people who are just really worldly and just love everything that the world puts out. Why? Because they're going to influence my children. I'm trying to raise my children not to be worldly, not to have all the worldly influences, not to just love all the things of this world, because if they're like that, then the love of the Father is not in them. And if they have friends that are like that, that's going to influence them to want to go down that path. And it's a lot easier to make the wrong choice than it is to make the right choice. So the last thing you need is more influences to go the wrong way in life. Choosing the wrong thing is pretty easy already. We don't need people, you know, pushing us that way or, or helping us down, that, the, down the wrong path. We want the people who are going to help us to improve, to do what's right. People who are going to be godly, people who love the Lord to be able to make the right choices and, and to help um, encourage us to do what's right. In Genesis chapter 34, there's a story here of Dinah. Genesis chapter 34. Jacob's daughter, Dinah, in verse number one, the Bible reads, And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. So Jacob was, you know, just like Abraham, he was called away from his home and they were living in the land of Canaan and under the direction of the Lord, living in places that weren't their home, but it was promised to them as a promised land that was going to be given to them in the future to his descendants. So he's staying uh, near his town near Shechem and um, his daughter decides to go out. It says it went out to see the daughters of the land. So she just went out and said, hey, I'm going to go hang out with their daughters and hang out with these, with these other girls that are live here. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. And Shechem spake unto his father Hamor, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. So what we see happening here, and it doesn't say how much time has gone by in these events, but it's not a, it's not a coincidence that the Bible says that Dinah went out to see the daughters of the land, and then the next thing we see is she's committing fornication with Shechem. Now, some people will say that this was that he forced her, because it says when he saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. But, and I, I'm not going to go too in-depth in this, but there is no reason to think that he forced her here just because it says he took her. I mean, lying with someone, you, you, you kind of take them anyways. But there, there's no indication. It doesn't say he forced her. He defiled her because anyone that commits fornication is defiled. I mean, a virgin that, that lies with somebody before they're married is defiled. And that's just the way that it is. So she was defiled by Shechem. But then we see, unlike where Amnon forced his sister, and then he hated her afterwards, because people are going to force somebody. How are you going to say that you love that person anyways? You really don't. I mean, to force them like that, you don't love that person. You hate him. But he loved this person. So it's, it's, a, it's a whole nother thing for people to commit fornication and, and still love them and want to be with them and want to marry them and things like that. Um, that makes more sense 
right? Typically, the person who forces somebody doesn't then just want to marry them. They usually just want to use them, abuse them, and be, have nothing to do with them, as we saw with Amnon. That's exactly what he did. But that is not what happens here at all. Shechem lays with her and then wants to marry her. And that's what happens in this story. So, that, you know, there, there's a few other reasons. I don't want to get into all that right now as to why I don't think he forced her. But um, those are some good examples. But what we see here, though, is that, I mean, fornication is wicked. Dinah wasn't raised that way. She wasn't raised to just commit fornication. But what did she do? She saw the daughters of the land, and she went and hung out with these ungodly girls. And we know that, the, like, basically most of these people weren't in... in, in uh, let me get there because I, I don't have the, the reference here. But the Bible basically says that, that um, this man, Shechem, was more honorable than, all, than the rest of the people there. And, um, but he was still a fornicator. So if he's more honorable than everyone else, because he was more honorable in that he wanted to marry her, he kind of wanted to, to, to do the things that they were asking him to do. And... Um, yeah, I can't. It, it, it's fine, but it, you could read the whole chapter later and you'll see where I was talking about it. Um, that it says that he's, he was more honorable than, than the rest of the men in the, in the place. But if he's the most honorable one there and he's committing fornication, that doesn't say much for everybody else. And that's, that's why I say, you know, when she went and hung out with the daughters of the land, well, now she surrounded herself with a bunch of people who think well, fornication is no big deal. And honestly, that's the, that's the thinking that people have today in our society, isn't it? Well, fornication isn't really that big of a deal. Who cares? I mean, everybody's doing it, right? You go, to, you go to public school. I mean, I went to public school. A lot of people were just like, that's just what you do. You go to prom, and that happens. Or you go here, and it happens. Or you, go, you know, whatever. And it's, and it's just, just what people do. Not a big deal. And if you allow your children to become friends with people that have that attitude, don't be surprised when even your children go off and commit fornication. Jacob didn't raise his daughter that way, but he allowed her to go off and to be influenced by the daughters of the world. And that's what happens. And then we have a whole nother disaster happening here because Jacob wasn't paying close enough attention to who his daughter was being friends with, where her brothers, now because she was defiled, decide to go off, and they kill everybody. And you can read that story. They, they say, oh, no, if you want to, you know, if we, we'll let you marry our sister, but you got to be circumcised, and everybody needs to be circumcised, and then we'll just be like one people. We'll marry, you know, each other and, and be able to, to join together. And they, they thought that was a good idea because Jacob had a lot of wealth. So like, hey, yeah, that sounds good. So they went through with it. And then after like a day or two when they're real sore because the men have just been circumcised, uh, Levi and, no, not Levi, Simeon and um, Reuben, I think, go through and um, I forget which, which two did it. No, Simeon and Levi, it is Levi. Simeon and Levi go through and kill all the men of the city, just bringing more destruction. And again, in all of that, you can trace back all of those events, even though you have different people acting individually, were started as a result of Dinah getting around the wrong people and making the wrong friends. Making friends have a big impact on our lives, who we decide to be friends with. And uh, you don't have to turn there, but in Judges 14, we see the story of Samson. Now, Samson, there's a lot of things that Samson did that weren't right, but he, uh, he also did a lot of things that were good. But in the story of Samson... In Judges chapter 14, he, he fell in love with, this, uh, with a Philistine woman. And he wanted to, to marry her. And if you remember the story, as he, you know, before the wedding, he's engaged to this woman. He's about to get married. He's a spouse of this woman. And he put forth a riddle. And uh, basically made a bet. He makes this bet. He puts forth a riddle. He says, okay, if you could answer this riddle, you know, I'll give you whatever, 15 changes of, of clothing and, and silver and whatever. And then they say to him, and then he says, but if, I, if you can't answer it, then each one of you has to give me one change of garment. It's like 15 people. So 
it was the he was gonna he was gonna get a lot of wealth for himself if they couldn't answer the riddle, and then they you know they couldn't do it they couldn't do it they finally get through to his to his to his wife to give them the answer they you know they kind of threaten her and they and she she gets the answer out of him and then they end up winning the bet and then he's so upset you know he just he leaves now he's he's married to this woman but he just kind of leaves. And then what happens is they give his wife to his friend to be his wife. And the Bible says in Judges 14:20 it says but Samson's wife was given to his companion which he had used as his friend. So First of all, we see Samson probably not being a very good friend because he was using someone as his friend. And then in turn, when he leaves for a little while, because he comes back, now this man has taken his wife to be his own. And again, when you choose a good friend, if you have a companion, if you have a friend, think about it. If you were to be put in that situation with one of your friends, would you just then take his wife? Not if you're a good friend, you won't. Or of course not. You'd be like, no, we can just wait till he comes back. I'm not going to take her. But this guy had no problems taking her. And I think part of the reason is because Samson used him as his friend and wasn't really a friend to him. And he, he obviously didn't choose a, a very good friend to have either because a friend is going to be loyal to you. Now, if you want to grow spiritually, you want to walk in the spirit more, you need to make friends that are going to be spiritually minded, the things that, that you do. And that's why, you know, going to church is a great place to meet people and to, and to make new friends. Being, and I believe this, being saved isn't enough of a standard to have when we choose who our friends are. I think it's a first step. I think someone ought to be saved if that's going to be your friend. And, and let me clear this up too. What I'm saying, there's a difference between friends and acquaintances. Like someone who you know you're familiar with in a way because Maybe you have dealings with people, maybe you work together, you have coworkers, you have things like that, but who you choose to really be your friend is a different story. And who we choose to really be personal with is something we need to be very careful on who we choose. And we ought to be choosing people who are saved, first of all, who are believers. The Bible says, what concord hath Christ with Belial? You know, what communion hath light with darkness? You know, that we're, that we're not supposed to be yoked together with unbelievers. And oftentimes you'll hear that verse preached on, on marriage, you know, on who we should choose to marry. But who you marry, I mean, isn't that really your best friend anyways? That should be. Whoever you're married to, your spouse, your husband, or your wife, that ought to be your best friend. And I'll add this, you know, your best friend, you ought not to be, you ought to be able to divulge or, or talk to your spouse about anything and everything because that is your best friend. And if you have to start talking about other things to other people than your spouse, you're going to have problems in your marriage. And you probably already have problems if you're not willing to talk to them. Your spouse needs to be your best friend. And if you have people that you need to be talking about other things, and I can't talk to my husband, I can't talk to my wife about this, you're opening up your door for problems because you ought to be able to talk to them about everything because that should be your closest, best friend that you could confide in and trust and, and be able to talk about anything with. When you start building other relationships outside of your marriage where you have some special, when you have special things with other people, it does bring trouble. And that's going to cause a wedge in your relationship. So I always tell people here, and you know, I'll say this right now, I try to help people out when anyone has problems in their life, if you're going through some hard times. I don't keep anything from my wife. So I will help people out, but I don't keep secrets from my wife. We keep, we keep things open. Oh, why? Because I want to have a good relationship with her because she's my best friend. If I need help from anybody, I'm going to go to her first. And she should come to me first. And um, there's nothing that I'm going to be divulging or sharing with anybody else in order to make sure we maintain a, a strong friendship and marriage. Your spouse ought to be your best friend, someone that you could trust more than anybody in the whole world.
But um, as I was saying here, you know, being saved isn't enough of a standard. I think the best way to determine who to be friends with is what direction they're heading. Because who you choose to be friends with, they could be saved, but they can just be going down the wrong path and getting into all kinds of sin. You don't want to be friends with a person like that. If they're going off and they're, and they're turning from God and they're getting into all kinds of wickedness, they're going to drag you down with them. Now, the hardest thing to do is to already have a friend. Maybe you were friends with them before and they were doing good and they were serving God and you've gotten close to them and now they're headed the wrong way. Well, if you are going to be a good friend to that person, you better tell them, hey, you're not doing right. Warn that person, love them, be a friend and say, yeah, but then they might not want to hang out with me anymore. Well, if they want to keep going that way, then good. You shouldn't want to, to be hanging out with them anymore because they're going the wrong way. Now, the reason why I say the direction is important, and turn if you would to 1 Samuel chapter 18, is because I'm not saying you have to have this standard of like super spirituality in order for somebody to be your friend. I'm not saying that, but the direction that they're heading does matter. And, and let, me, let me say it this way. There's, you could have someone in church that maybe has gotten a lot of sin out of their life and has gotten to a certain point to where they're living a pretty good life, but they start heading the wrong direction and start to take the wrong path. And then you have another person. Maybe they just got saved and they still have all kinds of messes and problems and sin in their life because they need to grow and they need to... to you know, start getting rid of that stuff and purge that stuff. But they're headed the right direction, okay? They have a lot of other problems. Maybe they still drink. Maybe they do this. Maybe, you know, maybe they have some other issues. But they want to do what's right. And they're looking to make changes. And they're looking to, to, to go that right direction. I'd much, much, much rather spend my time with a person who has maybe a lot of other issues, who's trying to head the right way, than the person who doesn't have all those issues, but they're headed the opposite way. Because the person who's had the opposite way is going to be a lot more likely to influence you to also go the opposite way. Whereas the other person, I could be friends with this person. Why? Because I could be a friend to them and I could help them out. And as long as they want to keep moving the right way and keep moving forward, I'm going to be there for them. I'm going to help them. And you know what? We could become good friends. And the person who's moving the opposite way, I'm going to be careful about that. If they, if they already were my friends, I'm going to try to warn them. Hey, don't go down that path. Instead of encouraging them like Jonadab did, be the good friend to them. But if they start going and it's, it's going too far, then I'm just going to say, all right. Sometimes for in, in, in their best interest, the way that you can love someone the most is just to cut ties and say, there's nothing more I can do for you. I was talking about this a, a week or so ago. I had, a, I had a friend in high school someone I'd known for years and years and years from grammar school and high school. And, um, and, and just mind you, th th this is, um, none of us were saved. This wasn't anything, this has, this has nothing to do with being saved, but just when you see someone going down the wrong path, we noticed him, he started getting involved. You know, all of us would drink or do some things like that, and, you know, and, and live that way. But he started getting into to crack. Really serious. And we would tell him, like, hey, man, you know, don't do that. So, you know, why, why are you doing that stuff? Oh, no, it's okay, man, it's okay. And, you know, of course, it started off with just a little bit, but real quickly it got bad. And we're telling him, look, dude, you know, like, don't do this. And, and no one wanted to be around him when he was going down. Because who would want to? I'm not going to take the ride with him going down to the, to the place where, you know, the, the only time someone like me would be there would be to buy drugs. And I mean, he would be getting ripped off. He'd be getting robbed. Why? Because he just wanted to do these drugs. I don't want to have anything to do with that. I don't want to be around someone like that and bringing that extra stuff on me. You know, and I'm not saying that I was headed in all the right directions. Okay, I wasn't. But we tried to help this person out and it got to the point where we just had to say, you know what? If you're going to be like this and if you're going to do this, then we have nothing to do with you. And it's not because we didn't like him. I mean, he was a buddy. He was a friend. You know, he was, he was, he was a friend that, 
that was in our group, that was, that was, you know, friends with us, but there comes a point where you have to just say, well, for your own good, if you want to, if you want to be friends with us, then you got to stop this stuff. You got to, you got to stop being like that. And, um, there's a truth to that. Now turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel 18. 1 Samuel 18. We're going to look now at a good friendship. And just get a few more uh, pointers here on, on having a good friendship and who we want to choose to be friends with. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, in verse number 1, we're going to see, we're going to see the friendship between David and Jonathan. David and Jonathan. Jonathan was the son of Saul. And of course, David was the king that replaced Saul. Both of these men were godly men. Both of these men feared the Lord. Both of these men were headed the right direction. Neither of them were perfect, of course, but nobody is. They had their mistakes, but, but they were both going the right direction, and they made a friendship that was a really good friendship to have. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 18, in verse number 1, and it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul. And mind you, 1 Samuel 18, this is right after David kills Goliath. Okay, so he kills Goliath. He's speaking unto Saul. And it says in verse 1, And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. So Jonathan immediately takes a David, you know, when he, when he sees David, he hears him talking, he's just like, like, he really connects with him and says his soul was knit to him. And Jonathan becomes a friend right away. He's willing to give him his shirt off his back. Right? He's like, here, have this. You know, here, take my weapon, take this. You know, I want you to have this. And starts right off the bat being a good friend to David and giving him these things. Now, why was the soul of Jonathan so closely knit with David's? Well, as I mentioned, David had just finished slaying Goliath. And turn back, if you would, to chapter 17. Because in the story of David and Goliath, what we see is David completely relies on the Lord to bring him that victory. David's a man, he's, he's willing to take the chance, he's willing to walk out by faith, he's willing to stand up and do something when something needs to be done. Because what happened? Goliath was, was coming out, you had the, the Philistine army and the children of Israel, their army were facing off each other, and they were kind of at a stalemate. No one was doing anything. You know, there was no fighting actually going on. So every day you'd have this giant Goliath come out and he said, hey, I defy the armies of Israel. You know, and he wants to send, send out your best warrior to me and we'll settle this matter now. You know, and basically saying, we don't have to fight this whole war. Just send out your best person to fight against me. And, and Israel was afraid. They were scared. Why? Because Goliath was a giant. He was this big, mighty warrior and everybody was afraid to face him. So when David comes and he sees this, he's like, who's this uncircumcised Philistine? Like, he doesn't look at him as this big, formidable force that nobody can beat. He looks at him and saying, who does this guy think he is defying God, defying the Lord, defying the armies of our Lord? He thinks that he can win? Why, just because he's got some muscles and some, and some armor and, and uh, weapon? You think that's what's going to save him? David already knew. He's like, no, the battle is the Lord's. We're in the right here. We're fighting a right fight. It's, it's righteous. We're doing good. And who is this guy opposing God? So look at verse number 45 in the story. It says, then said David to the Philistine, because, because Goliath tries to just belittle him and tries to make him feel real weak and that, you know, powerless against him. But David answers him, then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom thou hast defied. He's saying, you've defied God. You've defied the Lord. 
This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth, not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands." Very, very clear that David is not saying, well, I'm stronger than you and I know more than you know, so I'm going to be able to, to beat you and kill you. He says, no, this isn't my battle. It's not by my strength that I'm going to kill you because David actually was not a warrior at this point. He was, he was, he was a shepherd. But he knows, he's saying, you know what? I'll be, I'm willing to put myself out there for God, for God to bring this great victory and he's bold and confident in his faith toward God. You know what? God's going to kill this guy. God's going to give us delivery. But someone needs to stand up to him. And he did. And of course, you know, he, he gets a stone, slings it, hits him in the forehead, and he falls down dead. And then he cuts off his head and everything else. Right? It's, a great, it's a great story. I love it. So this is what happens. Jonathan sees what happens with David. He sees the boldness. He sees how on fire. He sees a man who's willing to stand up and fight for the Lord and, and do what's right. And instantly, he's like, this is my new best friend. Here's someone I want to be friends with. Why? Turn back, if you would, to chapter 14, 1 Samuel 14. Why? Because Jonathan had the same heart. Jonathan also was, a, Jonathan also was someone who's willing to put himself out there and, and separate himself from everyone else to do a work for God. He was willing to do the same thing. In, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 14, there's another battle going on here, a different battle. This is before David even shows up on the scene. Jonathan is in this battle. Look at verse number 6. And it's, it's kind of another standoff here in this situation. And basically, they're, they're both um, on each side of a valley. So uh, having the higher ground tactically is a lot better. So neither side wants to go over and go down the valley and then fight the uphill battle, right? Because that puts them at a disadvantage. So they're both kind of at the standoff. And Jonathan's like, you know what? We're going to do this. And we're going to win. Look at verse number 6 of chapter 14. The Bible says, And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over under the garrison of these uncircumcised. Notice, that's the same words that David was using. Like, who are these uncircumcised Philistines? Let's go over to this garrison of the uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee. Behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. Then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. If they say thus unto us, tarry until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and will not go up unto them. But if they say thus, come up unto us, then will we go up for the Lord hath delivered them into our hand and this shall be a sign unto us. And that's exactly what they did. They answered that way and what happens? God delivers them in their hand. They're, they're going up this uphill battle and he's just, just, just killing people left and right going up into their camp and he causes them all to flee and to run away because they thought there was this big sneak attack and it was two people. Why? The battle was the Lord's. Jonathan had faith in that. He knew that God could do that and he was willing to put himself out there and to risk his own life to fight this battle. He does this, then he sees David basically do the same exact thing, take the same stand and he's like, my best friend. That's someone I want to be friends with. Hey, do you want to serve the Lord? Do you want to get great victories for the Lord? Make yourselves friends with other people that want the same thing, that are willing to do the same thing, and you'll be an encouragement to each other. And all throughout this friendship with Jonathan and David, they're always looking out for each other. When Saul's trying to kill David, what does Jonathan do? He sticks up for him and says, no, don't kill him. And at the beginning, he actually intercedes and Saul listens to him. He says, yeah, you're right. I, I shouldn't kill him. He didn't do anything wrong. But then later, Jonathan's sticking up for him, and Saul's like throwing a javelin at his own son because Saul's just going off the deep end. 
But even with his own father, David, Jonathan is sticking closer to David than he is with his father Saul because of that good, godly friendship. Because Saul was headed the wrong way. Saul had gotten into sin and he kept on getting worse and worse and worse and getting away from the Lord. Jonathan was right with God and David was right with God. And they maintained that friendship. And when you see someone that also has their right, heart right with God and wants to win great victories for the Lord, it makes sense to then become great friends with them. And I have, there's a lot more examples of this. I'm not going to turn to them all for sake of time. There's one last point I want to make before we're done. But you can go through 1 Samuel in chapter like, you know, 18, 19, 20, and you're going to see the interactions between um, Jonathan and David and how good friends they were and they looked out for each other and stuff. And um, it was a great friendship to have. These are the types of friendships that we need to be looking for and striving to have with people. People who love God and, and want to do the things of God. And you have to ask yourself, who do you want to be friends with? Do you want to be friends with the Jonadabs of this world that have no problems speaking wicked things and encouraging you to sin? Of course not. I mean, we, we could see clearly the destruction that happens with that. And then you have to reap the consequences of listening to your stupid friend. Jonadab was a stupid friend. He was a subtle guy. Amnon could have been just fine. He would have gotten over his, his thing that he had for his sister. Or, like his sister even said, well, go to the king. You know, he won't hold anything back from you. At least try to make this as right as possible. Right? He could have gone some other avenue. And, you know, it still wouldn't be right, but it wouldn't have been nearly as bad as, as what he ended up doing because of that friend. So you could choose, you know, and, and watch out for these people, you know, I, and maybe you've been, you've been friends with someone like that for a long time, but you need to be able to, to, to watch out and identify who is really going to be a good friend and who's not. And, I, and again, I'm not saying just because someone's a sinner because there's some sin they have in their life that you just can't be friends with them, unless it's what 1 Corinthians 5 says on who we shouldn't even be eating with. Fornicator, railer, covetous. Okay, you look at that list in first. You know, let's just turn there real quick because I'd, I'd, actually this is too important to the sermon to look past. These should be deal breakers on who you're close friends with. Because remember, we're looking for people who are saved to be our friends. We're going to look at verse number 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. These are definite deal breakers for you. If you've been friends with someone in church and they're, they're known to you as like a brother or sister in Christ, and this is not just referring to some brand new believer who got saved yesterday, but this is someone who should know better. Verse 11 the Bible says, but now I have written unto you not to keep company. So if you're not to keep company, are you going to be friends with that person? No. How could you be? You're not, you're not, you can't even hang out with them. Not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous, so someone who's, someone who's sleeping around outside of marriage, or they're covetous, now that's, and that's a big one. You know, people who are always looking and wanting material things and just wanting things that they can't have or looking at, after things that they can't have. I mean, if you, if you have someone you become friends with and they're like looking after another man's wife or something, that's covetous. Or if they're always just interested in, in just all the money buying things and, and wanting all the riches and all this other stuff, that's covetous. Or an idolater or a railer, someone who's railing on other people and bringing, you know, making false accusations and just slandering people and railing on other people. Or a drunkard, that doesn't need any explanation. Or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. These, this is a very serious list of things, and that ought not to be who your friends are. I mean, biblically, that's not someone we keep company with. So, you know, you can apply that list. 
But like I said, I mean, we know we're all sinners. None of us is perfect. And everyone's at a different point in their spiritual growth in this life. We want to make sure that we could find someone to be our friend is someone that loves God. Someone who wants to do what's right. Someone that will really be there for you and will help and encourage you to do right. That's the person you want to be your friend. If, if Amnon had a godly friend, he wouldn't have got himself in the situation he got himself in. The Bible says that you know, faithful are the wounds of a friend. And a good friend, remember this too, don't, don't break your friendship with someone because they try to help you by pointing out a problem area in your life. That's actually a really good friend because it takes guts and, it, and, it's, and it's harder to actually go to someone and tell them, hey, you're in sin here. You've got a problem and, and go and you trying to help you. And even if they don't do it the best way, you know, the Bible says we ought to approach people humbly and in the spirit of meekness and, and try to entreat them that way to, to get them to see. Even if your friend isn't the best at doing that, if they're willing to put your friendship on the line by trying to help you and say, no, this is wrong, that's a good friend. There's a lot of people, I would bet, in Amnon's life, because he was the king's son, that really didn't care that much about him, and they just cared more about being friends with the king's son, because there's probably a lot of benefits that go along with that, right? There's, there's probably a lot of good meals he gets to eat hanging out with the king's son. But if, someone, if he had a friend that truly cared about him, he'd be willing to lose all of that and just say, no, Amnon, you know, this is wicked and that's wrong and you need, you need to figure out a way to get past that and, and you know, I'll help you with that, but, but you can't pursue this. That's, that's the wrong path. And, and just being able to tell someone they're wrong, that, that could be a sign of a good friend. So let's, uh, let's be very careful who our friends are. We see, we see biblical examples of how devastating it can be in a person's life. So, uh, you know, let's, let's try to follow these principles and, and find people, other people who, who love the Lord enough to fight the, the big battles and make friends with them. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the instruction that you give us. Lord, uh, we thank you for not making it complicated because it's really not complicated, although I think sometimes it may be difficult because we build emotional attachments to people and we also long to have emotional attachments with friends and, and to be friends with people, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to be strong and to be able to, to strengthen ourselves in, in you and knowing that if we're going to do what's right, you're with us and that, and that um, you, can, you can encourage us and strengthen us. Lord, help us to find the friendships that we need here, but help us not to compromise um, what your word says on, on who we should be friends with just in order to have a friend. God, help us to use these good principles. And I pray that you please help the parents here to, to monitor their, their children and, and who their children become friends with because it, it has such a huge impact on our lives, dear Lord. And um, it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.